Hello and welcome to our webinar, Women Leading the Way in Processing. I'm your moderator, Kristen Kazarian, Managing Editor of Powder and Bulk Solids. Our panel today includes Casey Bickhart, CEO of Gemco, Carrie Hartford, Director of Business Development with Jenneke and Johansson, and Huda Ashback, Lead Process Engineer with CELO, CELA Nanotechnologies. After the panel discussion, we will be taking questions from the audience. Thank you for joining us and let's get started. Okay, so the first round of questions is basically on industry trends. And um, the first question, Huda, it would be great if you could answer this. What are the common oversights in combustible dust safety protocols that still exist in the industry? So combustible dust safety is really critical in industrial settings. And there definitely are a lot of oversights that happen, which increase a lot of the risks pretty significantly. One of the first things that pops into my mind is having inadequate DHAs, dust hazard analyses. Um, there's a lot of scenarios to go over and you overlooking those scenarios pretty easily, not having the proper people in the room and also not having a representative sample for that combustible dust testing that you're relying on. A uh, representative sample could usually just means of the bulk, but often material does segregate in processes. So you also need to make sure that if material does segregate, that you're getting the combustible dust properties of possibly like accumulated dust in your system. This can also lead to usually secondary explosions in combustible dust safety incidences. And also there could be improper housekeeping due to this dust accumulation. Um, this also comes from insufficient training. If you're not training your personnel to make sure that they're keeping up with that housekeeping, if they don't know what the hazards even are when handling combustible dust, that usually leads to a lot of oversights as well. And that training actually needs to happen pretty consistently. Um, as people are changing every six months or every year. And also there's, I've often have seen very uh, ineffective or just not proper dust collection systems, ventilation systems, or even explosion protection systems. Sometimes people don't realize how critical it is to have these devices customized to your process and then ensuring that you're actually complying um, with both national and international standards and regulations like NFPA codes, OSHA guidelines, things like that. Um, so we have seen a lot of issues where even just they have all of these things in place and then the there's poor maintenance on the tools. And if certain tools, they can generate heat or sparks due to this lack of maintenance and it can actually lead to ignition of dust clouds. So I think that's Ooh. a pretty <laughs> wide list of things to kind of keep in mind. It's very comprehensive. Great, thank you so much. Next question for Carrie. How have material testing and bulk solid behavior assessments evolved to better predict and mitigate process safety risks? Yeah, thank you. And I wanna, it's gonna tie into what Huda was saying. So as you are designing a process, you're working through a process, we see that most of the issues arise not from the process of what you wanna convert your material to, it's actually in the handling of the material through your process. And a lot of focus, everyone's focused on the process. Can we convert? Can we make what we wanna make? And not much attention gets paid to how do you actually handle the material through the process? So we, it's super important to characterize your material to understand how will it flow? Is it frictional? Is it fine? Is it going to flood through your system? Is the arching or rat holding a concern? Because if your process doesn't work well and then you have folks sledgehammering the side of the bins, you're creating that spark potential that Huda was talking about. And in any safety check, the first thing you usually look at is are you using the right equipment for the job? That's like the first checkbox. And if you're having to hammer your bin, your bin's not the right equipment for that job. And that often gets missing. It's like, oh, well, I have the wrong hammer. Let me use this different mallet. <laughs> Let me use this different hammer. And that creates very unsafe environments. It can be cause um, rotator cuff tears. It can cause a lot of issues uh, to safety, to personnel, and just putting people in unsafe um, situations. And not handling material properly can lead to flooding and that dusting, and then you have the housekeeping issues. And if you're not on top of that, and it is often hard to get enough people that want to clean up people that want to clean the facility and keep it clean and the budget gets pretty slim in that arena but that can lead to really dangerous environments so there are ways to test flow flowability test material on a bench scale level 
to understand the combustible dust, to understand the cohesive nature, the frictional nature, the bulk density of the material, so that you can design reliably to handle your material through the process. So the tools are out there. I think what happens and the gap is that folks don't learn that education in college. I'm a mechanical engineer. I was never taught about the flow of solids. So it's still a weird concept to people that are not in the powder industry who are actually yeah. dealing with bulk solids. It does not flow like liquid. But yet we're only talking about flow of liquids in colleges. And that's that's what's in our mind is how to how does the liquid flow? Sure, powder will flow the same way, but it definitely is not the same thing. So there are tools out there, there's resources out there, there's webinars, there's trade shows where we do training, which is really important to understand if you're unfamiliar in this area, to learn about it so we can advance the industry. All right. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next question. How about Casey? Um, how are you pacing your automation advances to mitigate the lack of available labor these days? Uh, we're outpacing the lack of available labor right now. So um, at Gemco, we're very, very focused on automation. I think that's huge in the industry. Um, and the reason being is when you do have a lack of available labor, and that's not just only operators, mechanics, um, specialized labor, engineering, um, it could be from anything from your person, uh, your purchasing personnel to your salespeople. Um, we, you know, everyone's experiencing hiring shortages or, or they need people. So um, it's difficult. And one of the things that we do is um, we drive for lights out technology uh, because for to have someone constantly monitor or watch the machines um, and have one person monitor and watch one machine it gets very, very cumbersome. Um, so in automation, you're relying on, you know, strategy to make sure that every batch is even uniform consistency, reliability. So then that way from batch to batch, you have repeatable results and that's huge. So the automation plays a significant role in how your batch is actually going to end up. And uh, to tie in with everybody, that comes with uh, stakeholder awareness, which uh, is is huge for us. And that's the stakeholder, not only of the operator being there, it's the mechanic, it's the safety personnel, it's the cleanup crew that's coming afterwards, um, it's the, the helpers, it's the plant managers, the plant engineers. And those um, those stakeholders all need to be in the development of the automation. So then therefore they have their sign offs like I know on our uh, on screens now uh, that get downloaded into your batch records, uh, you can have those signatures those sign offs that um, you know a supervisor saw this a manager sign uh, saw this, not just for the uh, blips of you know something that went wrong in a batch or we need to write an exception report. Um, but for regulatory, it's very, very nice to have who touched the batch, when did they touch it, as well as all timestamps. Um, so getting getting into that, especially in the in the in the food industry and uh, FDA, um, you know, is really really interesting. It's a it's a different level once you get into that. Um, but also, uh, what I think is very important is that you need to have focus groups with these stakeholders. You need to meet with them ahead of time. Before the development happens, you need to find out what their pain points are. You need to find out what's not working for them in a manual process. So when you go to automate it, you're creating those efficiencies, you're getting more effectiveness, and your product, your end result is going to be more reliable, more consistent, which exactly is what your end user wants. So when you look at the automation of equipment, it's really important that you're starting with everyone who's going to have a say in the end result, uh, especially quality QC uh, of that end product. And um, I think uh, lights out technology is the way to go, meaning like, what can you do if you don't need that third shift or you don't have that second shift? How are you going to set yourself up for success in your own production lines? Uh, what's the return on investment for your technology? I just think that's super important to, to consider um, how much is going to advance your own company. Great idea. Lights out technology. I love it. Okay, so this next section, we're just going to get into the nitty gritty and ask some questions that I'm sure everybody has been waiting for. Okay, Huda, how do you balance assertiveness and diplomacy in a high stakes engineering environment? 
Uh, this is a fun question. I feel like this essentially comes down to having great effective communication skills and also having good leadership skills. So you need to make sure that you, when you go to say your point, that you're making sure that you're clarifying your goals and your priorities, that you make sure that you develop your emotional develop, uh, emotional intelligence skills as well and communicate very clearly and concisely. Um, make sure you're actively listening too, and that you're not just being assertive alone. There's that diplomacy aspect of making sure you are doing that active listening. You want to make sure that you're also staying very professional and respectful, especially when you want to be assertive. Um, and then make sure you bring out that empathy side of you. Um, be empathetic, be understanding of their point, hear their point, and then make sure you're using I statements. Like make sure you're more um, frame your assertions from like your own perspective to avoid any other like uh, ac sounding accusatory in any sort of way. And there's also negotiation and compromise. Um, you do have to realize that being assertive doesn't mean it's always going to be your way. There is a middle ground and you do have to hear that part out. Um, another way to make sure that you're doing this correctly is make sure you're actually getting some good feedback and including that feedback mechanism in your daily work life and make sure you're leading by example when you're wanting to be assertive. So I think that those okay. are the main strategies that I think are pr pretty helpful in effectively balancing that assertiveness and that diplomacy and making sure that you're really effectively maintaining a positive work environment while also um, making your point pretty clear. Yeah, I absolutely. Really, I really like that, Huda. And to add on to that is I think when you are sort of has to be from a point of knowing your technology, knowing your what you're saying is actually correct and what you believe is the best point. So my encouragement to anybody in industry is making sure that you are gaining your technical skills, focusing on doing your job the best and knowing everything about your job and your technology and your skills so that when you do make a point, it's for it's on purpose. You have a point for, for a purpose and people understand that because they know that you understand your job. Yeah, Absolutely. I'll add I'll add one thing. Um, one way that you can definitely be effective um, being assertive is take your ego out of it, which I think is exactly what you're saying. Just take your ego out. It's not about the ego. It's about the end result. And is that end result going to drive the conversation forward? Is it going to drive the project forward or is it going to drive ROI for your company or and if it is, then be assertive. I think I think that's a great reason to be assertive um, because it's something, it's a third party, right? It's not about you. Um, uh, sometimes I would also suggest getting a mentor and, and getting a coach of how to talk assertively. Assertive is like a whole nother language. So when we talk about it, um, you know, in my company, uh, we don't ask, oh, we don't, we don't say, oh, I'm just following up on this, or I'm just checking in. We say, can I get feedback on blank? Because it's a different way. It's a, just a different approach. Um, and that's, and we talk about the language of assertiveness or the language of getting a project done or what needs to move something forward without any of that um, uh, possible ego coming into play. And it's very difficult um, you know, because we're all go-getters and we want something to happen, um, but it, I think it's important. Absolutely. Um, well, and this kind of, this next question kind of leads into that too. Um, uh, Carrie, what advice would you give to young women engineers or young women in any manufacturing field facing imposter syndrome in their roles? Yeah, that's a great question. And I actually Googled what imposter syndrome meant last night, just to make sure we are all on the same page. But it's really when you doubt your own skills and your successes, and then you feel as if you're not talented enough or worthy enough for others to believe you. And then that's kind of scares you away. And, and you're really, you're scared that one day people will realize that you're not who you say you are. But I think understanding that definition is, is very important. Because if you realize, I don't know if any of us feel fully comfortable of where we're at, but we have to look at what we've succeeded in. What have been your successes? And you can feel confident in that and that if you've had these successes, it's bound up based off something. And it's not to have a big head on your shoulders. It's just to say, hey, I'm doing what I think is the next best step for the company, for a purpose, not for my ego. I love that, Casey. 
it's really for the good of the whole of your company and of the business. I'm speaking especially specifically for business and just keep going at it. Take ownership. It doesn't mean you have to know all the answers to the questions. It's taking ownership of what you're trying to drive and what you're trying to do in your job and finding out the answers. Um, just reaching out, talking, discussing, hey, I feel weak in this area. How can I improve in this area? And having those conversations. So that imposter syndrome, I think, happens to everybody. Yeah. And you're not alone. Nobody is alone in that. And just be who you are. Be the best version of yourself. I love the idea of mentorship. I love the idea of uh, we're going to talk a bit more about feedback and how to receive that. But just become the best person of who you are. And again, it goes back to become really good in your technical skills. Don't just try and jump up to, oh, I want to do management, more and more management. No, you got to actually be really good and know what you're talking about. I agree. Because then that will naturally come. Okay. This is kind, of, kind of along the same line. Casey, how do you handle when a coworker or a boss considers you, quote unquote, too soft at work? And how do, how do you stand up for yourself if you see it happen to somebody else? Sure. And I'm going to even just really touch on that word, that language too. Um, and I have been called in my career too driven, too smart, too quick, um, you know, to go. Uh, and all of these things um, that I always thought growing up was like a benefit. Wow, that's great. You know, like um, what's the opposite of that? Would I want to be that? Should I, should I feel, you know, less smart and a little more lazy? I, you know, I didn't really understand that. And I think sometimes women uh, get the word two on them and it, it really, really uh, damages the psyche. I'll tell you, I, I've, I've sat there after someone said that to me, I, I had someone um, say, well, I just didn't talk to you about that because you'd ask too many questions. And I, 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 I scratched my head because I said, wow. Uh, so someone wants to learn, someone's curious, uh, someone needs information or communication, but that was said to me. I don't think it was said to me out of harm or, you know, but it was definitely dismissive. And I think sometimes as women, we get dismissed, not all the time, just sometimes. And it normally comes right after somebody says the word too. And that could be you're too soft or you're too much you're too driven, you're too slow, you're too this, you're too that, because what it does to our psyche is it literally, it's to anybody you're saying it to, it doesn't matter who, it changes them and they say, oh, oh, I'm not supposed to be that way, I should be this way, or they need me to be this way, but that's not who I am. So one of the things in, um, that I coach and mentor and, and also talk to myself about is just be authentic be who you are because you were designed that way to get you someplace, which is exactly where you are today. So something that you did worked. And in addition to that, there's no problem with changing an approach. There's no problem with changing an approach, but just realize that all those little authentic bits are gonna come out. So as long as you adapt your approach, but not change your, your total uh, approach, I think, I think that's okay. Um, but I would also suggest to be around people who want you to succeed. You will hear less too. And if it were, a, a, I, I've had this said to me, but if it were a boss coming to me or something like that, and normally what happens is when someone says that to me, I said, really, what makes you say that? And then that question makes them say, oh, well, I thought you were doing this. Okay. So then I explain. So if I ask questions to get information about X, Y, Z, what does that, you know, is that a negative thing? And then they go, oh, no, that's not really a negative thing. I say, oh, so it's not this. And you start to create the dialogue to change their language. Mm -hmm. So it's a mentoring, it's a training, it's a learning. And and um, I'd, I'd love to see, unless it's, you know, I, I'd love to see that too go away. You know, I I, I don't really want that for, for anybody out there. Um, but I, um, I think that we have an opportunity to help train other people when they use it. We have an opportunity to help train ourselves in our own mindset and say, hmm, uh, 
something's working for me. I'm here for a reason. Um, and I think that's something to be celebrated. You got here. Um, and now you can add more skills to that and become even more empowered, uh, you know, thoughtful, creative, curious, and keep keep learning. Because I think learning uh, and being curious about where the other person is coming from is always great. Uh, so I would say find people who want you to succeed and start to change the, the language, change the language. Do you mind if I chime in on that? That was lovely, by the way. That's like very on point. And I think, you know, when I was new coming into the workplace, we're told like feedback is just this like critical thing. And it is, but I, I suddenly have realized that there's good feedback and then there's bad feedback and, and good feedback, it has to be receivable. It has to be actionable and it has to be pretty well balanced. Like it needs to be a conversation between the two people. And also within that, I think I kind of categorize feedback in four buckets. There's positive feedback and negative feedback, but even within those, there's constructive and non-constructive feedback. Um, so even someone can just say like, oh, that presentation you did was great. That's not really constructive to that person, right? You have to get into why was it great? What were the certain things that they did that made it great? Or same thing to giving negative feedback. Somebody just says, oh, you're too soft. Like that's negative feedback but it's not constructive like oh well i think you should have clarified your point a little better or you should have or it, to make it constructive for the person i think is pretty key and effective feedback i think is and also like hearing ineffective feedback and learning hey some things i can dismiss and this was not effective so right yeah absolutely um Huda, while we're on that, um, how, how can organizations foster an inclusive culture that promotes gender diversity in any type great. of role? Yeah, that's great. I think the first place it starts is leadership's commitment to want this. Um, another thing, and because they can implement all of these things and kind of foster that culture within the company, uh, making sure that the recruitment strategies are being uh, reducing their bias when they're doing the hiring processes, uh, making sure that they're um, inclusive in their onboarding process and even the mentorship process that they're doing, that it's happening pretty equal, regardless of where somebody's from or who they are. Um, and then also, I really enjoyed the concept of ERGs. I don't know if you guys have heard of those. They're employee resource groups. So they help really highlight and um, celebrate the culture that's within the community. Um, making sure that professional development is something that can be offered to everybody in a very equal way, keeping that growth mindset um, in mind, and then making sure there's regular training on diversity and inclusion. I know companies have it, maybe they have it one time when you join, but it's nice to keep it regular. Um, and then create the feedback mechanism again, but allow that feedback from the minority groups and to how they feel about the culture. Do they feel included? and make sure that the policies and practices align with that type of culture. Absolutely. Okay, Carrie, can you share an experience in the industry that led you to change your approach to your job? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good, good one. And, you know, I think hopefully we have a diverse group of folks on this call in terms of being new to their jobs, um, having experience, not experience. And I think the biggest thing is when you are new to your job and going out, say, if you're working in a plant, you know, there's always the two. Maybe you're too small, you're too tall, you're too something, <laughs> one way or another. Ooh, yeah. Something. And, and people are going to make judgments about you even before you speak. So as you become confident in that and speak, give that respect to people that do have more experience than you and say, I want to learn from you. I want to understand this. Doesn't mean they're always right but it means that you've shown respect that you want to understand this and we need to make improvements and changes if that's where you need to go. Uh, early on in my career, I, as soon as I learned to give that respect, it was my input was received much better. I was listened to more. I was given um, the ability to have a voice in the room. So that really helped. And then, you know, sometimes people are super helpful and maybe it is because you're a woman and they think they want to help you. That's okay. <laughs> I, 
we don't have to really be like, no, you don't help me. But it's like, okay, yeah, let's help. Let's work to this. And once they see that you are just a normal person who wants to work towards the end goal, then it doesn't become, let me help this woman, but let me just help work on this project. Absolutely. Nice. Okay, well, um, this is our next question and our last. Um, what challenges, Casey, do you feel that women face in a typically male-dominated field? Um, and how can that be overcome? Sure. Um, you know, whether you're talking about uh, being a CEO, whether you're talking about being a process engineer, whether you're talking about being a mechanical engineer, um, there are a lot, it could be a maintenance mechanic. There are a lot of male dominated fields um, that women are not normally in. Um, and I think the biggest challenge is I don't think like a man. I don't know how they speak. I don't, I don't know how they think. I just don't know. Uh, so our biggest, um, I would say, um, oh, I kind of best powerful way to get over that hurdle is be curious, is be curious. So what I do is I ask a lot of questions and I'll say, uh, you know, oh, what made you say that? Or how did you think about that? Or uh, what other things are you thinking about? Um, and I'll ask them those questions or what else did you consider? Um, sometimes if I have something I'll th you know, already in my head, I'll phrase the question of, have you considered X, Y, and Z, right? Where I'm leading the question. And I think women are super duper smart that they can master their language and then they can actually speak and get the answer of what they're wanting, not just a nebulous like like we were talking about feedback, not just feedback for, for the sake of feedback. No, I need pointed, directed feedback. I need pointed, directed answers to help me understand um, where someone else is thinking. Uh, the other thing is um, in my business, we do a lot with DISC assessments and any other type of personality. So it could be Myers-Briggs, uh, could be could be anything. And um, what those assessments do is they they give us a general idea of communication styles, right? I mean, I'm still not going to know everyone, but once I know their communication style, oh, boom, I know how to ask them, how quickly to ask them, how slow to ask them, you know, what when to approach them, when not to approach them. A lot of our communication styles is just understanding, right, before we even get to that curiosity, questions or asking is at least learning how to approach, when to approach, and what's the best way to approach. So um, I think there needs to be some time to um, for people just starting out in a job, uh, younger people, to really develop that. And I didn't have that in college either. Um, so I had to learn this to understand how to be the best effective way, right? Because we're only as powerful and as wonderful and as successful as how we communicate. So when you get better at mastering your skills and your techniques, you have to have that. That's the base of anything, right? Your expertise. Then the next level of your career, I think, is all about communication. How well you make person A talk with person B. I constantly around here don't call myself a CEO. I call myself a facilitator because I'm literally seeing someone speak French and another person speaks Spanish and I'm seeing them cross like this and just totally miss the mark. So um, I would say, please try to, you know, one way to get beyond a male dominated role um, or, or job, right? Male dominated field is um, learn your expertise, just as Carrie said, it's number one, and then really hone your communication skills. And that comes first from body language, approach, type of communication. Um, learn who you're speaking to. It's the same thing with any negotiation. You don't go into a negotiation unless you know who you're talking to, right? You know everything about them. You know what they like, what they don't like. And then you can have a really successful negotiation. If you walk in and you do not know, you need to ask those questions. And you need to understand where they're coming from. And then once you understand their motivations, you're going to have a pal for life. And just like cares that they're going to want to help you because no. you're going to understand their motivation. Wow. You're going to bring them around to your motivation, bring them around to the company motivation, and then you're going to have a pal for life. So um, there's a lot of great minds out there. Um, 
Uh, and um, I would, you know, want to know, just be curious. I think it starts with curiosity. I think that's the, that's a very good, powerful tool that we have in our tool belts. I love that. Katie, yes. I just want to add on to part of that is, I love when you say like, I didn't, I don't think like men. That's so true. But I don't think like Buddha. I don't think like Casey. I think like Carrie, because that's who I am. And we need to embrace that. And that's why we're hired for our minds to to do a job, to think how we think. And that is a beautiful part. And if we give that up, that's a shame. And communication is key. And uh, learning that DISC style. I mean, again, we're just throwing out acronyms. Maybe we have a whole thing on communication, but learning personality types and how to work with them and learning which personality types drain you and which mm -hmm. ones energize you. And it's not wrong that they drain you, but the more you acknowledge that they are draining and be like, okay, that's just okay. I'm okay with that because I know this is what happens, but we still can communicate for that. Right. So it's just such right. a beautiful thing once we understand communication of who we are, not giving that up, but adjusting to who you're communicating to. Perfect. Terrific. And, uh, just a little lighthearted thing too. When you are in a very male dominated field, or maybe even there's men that are in a woman dominated field, it's actually nice to find your minority groups, right? It's nice to meet other women that are going through it. It helps you normalize things like imposter syndrome. It helps you mm -hmm. understand that you're dealing with very similar uh, struggles that other people are too. And and like you said, it's not always just women. Sometimes it's different minorities of thought or like people coming from different backgrounds. So reach out, know that you're not alone and you're not there dealing with these struggles by yourself. Right, absolutely. Well, um, what we have on track next is our question and answers from our um, our audience. So just type in your questions in the field and um, our wonderful panel will answer them. Thank you very much for joining us and I hope you enjoyed yourself. I'm very shy. How can I gain confidence? I'm also just starting out in engineering. Yeah, that's a great, great question. You know, when you do start out, it can be very intimidating. You really only, you only know what you were taught in school and hopefully you had some internships. So I would say acknowledge that you are shy, acknowledge that you are new to this and seek out help. Don't be afraid to ask questions. I know early on I was told to do certain tasks and I didn't fully necessarily understand the, the reasoning behind the task. So it was that curiosity that Casey was talking about and saying, can we, I need help in this area. I need help understanding how I'm supposed to approach my project the best, how I'm supposed to move forward. There's always going to be other shy people that you can also meet and get to know and ask them questions of how do you have in, um, the courage to speak up? So no, you are going to have to be stretched out of your comfort zone. But don't be afraid to go into the meetings to listen in, to speak up when necessary, because they do need your voice and they do need your your contribution. Joining different groups, if you need to get better at public speaking, I highly recommend getting better at public speaking. There's Toastmasters, there's different groups that can help you overcome that shyness. And I know there's quite a few people that I know that have done that and become much more able to present well, able to be present in front of a group of people and contribute to that. Great, thank you, Carrie. Mm -hmm. The next question is, how do you gain emotional intelligence? That's a pretty great question. It's, um, for some people it comes naturally, but for other people you kind of have to take a few different steps. I think it really starts with yourself so you really have to, you know, focus on your self-awareness, be able to reflect on your own emotions, do some mindfulness and meditation, and seek feedback from others on that. Um, another part is like self-regulation. So pause before you react. Um, make sure you have good coping strategies. Make sure you're setting like good personal goals so that you're managing your emotions and keeping track of that yourself. Um, another thing is making sure you know what your values are, what your personal goals are in that, and then stay very positive. I know sometimes it's easy to be hard on yourself with it, 
but just stay positive and keep going on. Um, empathy is another big portion that you have to kind of hone in. Um, ways you can do that is by practicing your active listening. Um, make sure you're actually taking in other people's perspectives on um, topics and showing compassion to others when they do express something. And another thing is the, the social skills. Make sure you improve your communication, build those relationships with people, and uh, learn a little bit about conflict resolution because you're bound to get into some sort of conflict when you're in um, high intense environments or any time in life when any type of relationship. And just make sure that you continue to learn on what it takes to get there. So read books and take courses and workshops and just practice it regularly. And I love that, Huda, because nobody's perfect. Nobody is perfect. And we are going to mess up and we are going to stumble. But it's also taking that moment, the conflict resolution, maybe after the fact, come back and be like, you know, I apologize. My reaction to what you said was was not correct. And this is really what I was was getting at. So don't be afraid to continue to talk about it, bring it back home and, and realize that none of us are perfect and, and offer that grace. Great, thank you both. Um, the next question we have asks, what are the latest approaches to equalizing diverse population in an organization? That's a good, hard question. <laughs> Probably why we're all still sitting here. You know, I think so much it comes back to that respect, to that active listening, asking questions, and as a leader, making sure that you are hearing from the shy person as well as the vocal person, as well as the, I don't want to say the word too, because nobody's too that, nobody's too shy, nobody's too vocal, but we have to make sure that as leaders, we are reaching out to all the minority groups, all the people in our organization and beyond organization to hear their thoughts and do that active listening, seek out their interests. I think that would help, help in that respect. Absolutely, thank you, Carrie. Our next question is, wondering if you can comment on the latest manufacturing organizational structures in companies that have grown out of the flat organization structure. Sounds like a good one for Casey. Or anybody. Casey might be muted. Hi, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? That's okay. Yes. Okay, sorry, go ahead. What was the question again? The question is, wondering if you can comment on latest manufacturing yeah. organizational structures and companies that have grown out of the flat organization structure. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I I mean, we're, we're seeing it now. I mean, if you're talking about flat, like organizational structure where um, everyone is leading up to one set of leadership, right? Um, and one person. Um, we're, to, we're constantly working towards that. And I know a lot of other companies are because it allows you to do more, um, a lot more when you have many teams working on things and then some sort of structure obviously leading up to the top. So um, I think top-down communication is super important. I think bottom-up communication is super important. And you do that when you have these structures that allow for that communication flow. So um, I hope that helps. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Carrie. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I know our company is a fairly flat organization in terms of, um, again, management styles, but it's super important to have those teams and those groups that are going to help mm -hmm. advance their area of study and their expertise and skill set. And then that all works together for the common good. And hopefully the organization has very clear vision and mission statements and purse purpose statements and pillars of success and what everything needs to stand on. So all those groups are working towards that common goal. Absolutely, thank you both. Um, the next question is, are there any new technologies you are excited about in the powder and bulk solids industry?
well, I don't, I don't necessarily know that it's new, but I think it's novel that we're, re, we're utilizing some of it. Um, but we have a lot of, a lot of testing equipment. Um, and we focused a lot on, um, obviously, our company, we do services, right? We do um, powder blending and powder drying. Um, and then we also sell the equipment to do powder blending and powder drying. Uh, but one of the one of the greatest ways that we reach customers is by always talking to them about what what's happening to their their part particles as they're blending. What's happening when it's mixing? What's happening? Right, Carrie knows all about this. But you know, um, it's so interesting to us. So when we use particle size analyzers, um, when we use agitation in our in our equipment. Um, and we see the difference that it's making in powder flow, um, especially additive manufacturing, um, when we can take the moisture out of uh, particles and make sure that the flow is better or, or whatever's gonna happen in their raw ingredient to get to the final product, everything happens through a process. And when you can have the data and the analytics to go along with it, um, it's incredibly helpful. So um, I would I would strongly encourage everyone to to know what's happening with your blends and know what's happening with your your uh, your batches, especially in powders, because everything starts with the raws. Everything starts with the raws, and the process that you're doing is going to be instrumental in making sure that you get to the final the final result. Yeah, I love that because adding on to that is as you look at the particles, there's some fantastic tools coming out there using technology to look at the multi-physics aspect. How is the moisture migrating between particles based off the temperature variations outside of the packaging or even within the material? If it comes out warm and it sits, you know, how is moisture going to migrate? So there's tools that we've developed and, and there's tools out there to look at how and predictive um, behaviors of how this material will handle with that moisture, with that temperature, with this adjustment. So there's a lot more kind of digital twinning if I can say a, a common word out there, to say, can we look at these materials? Can we understand their behavior now, which we can through the different tests? And then what happens when you put it into a different environment? So based off tests, based off results, we can look at that using different tools, such as discrete element method modeling for transfer shoots, looking at how particles react to each other and it with a computer simulation. So it's taking that bench scale testing applying the technology that's available out there and coming out with the right design for that material. Great, great, great answers. Um, the next question goes right to Huda. Huda, what was your biggest challenge from an engineering perspective when you first started at CELA? Processes are so complex, so how did you learn everything you had to learn to be such a great engineer? Uh, that's so sweet. Thanks, David. Um, so when I first started at CELA, there was definitely a lot of stuff happening, a lot of processes. And I had this initial learning curve where I was deep diving into documentation on the processes I hadn't learned. I even looked up manuals for tools that I hadn't seen. Um, I I think asking questions was the biggest thing. Like I just wasn't afraid to reach out to our colleagues. They're always so welcoming and um, they always gave me insights and kind of helped me understand like some of the nuances that was more applicable to our processes and not just what was out in literature. And then I remembered I started getting a lot of hands-on experience. So I started doing some just small scale projects where I could get to know the material myself and um, see how it kind of handles and and just kind of like that iterative learning where each project, I think I was just learning new lessons and each little mini project I would be a part of, I was uh, definitely coming out with uh, new learnings. And I think the big thing was just the great collaborative work environment that we have. So just reaching out to peers, having peers review some of my work to make sure I was thinking about it in a similar perspective that other engineers are in our um, work. And then also just continuous education constantly reading papers, I'm constantly buying textbooks and um, leaving my um, kind of mind open in that learning phase. And I hope that never stops, but yeah, thank you for asking. Okay, thank you, Huda. Um, the next question is, what are some types or concrete ways to improve your communication skills? I can help with that. 
Okay. Um, question. Questions, right? Uh, there's this awesome book. It's called um, Change Your Questions, Change Your Life. And um, it's a quick little read, and I encourage everyone to everyone to use it. But um, the majority of the time, we're all recovering judgers. And what that means is that we all come into things thinking that we know something or thinking that it should be a certain way. And um, this book is just a, a, a cute little book, a quick read, and um, it goes through how you can uh, question something to become a curious learner. So from a recovering judger, we all become curious learners. And that's super important, uh, especially when you're walking into a situation, right? Everybody's gonna bring something different to the table. And no matter how you had a vision for a particular meeting or how you had a thought of how something should have gone, something's gonna throw a monkey wrench in there. Something's gonna happen. It's gonna throw you off. And the more that you become a curious learner and you question, well, how did that happen? What made that happen? Um, and notice I don't say why, 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 right? It's always what makes you think that way or what made you say that? Or that's interesting, tell me more. Uh, they're open questions versus this closed. Like, why would we do it that way? Um, you know, something just to change your questions helps you really become a better presenter. Um, it helps you become a better coworker. It helps you become a better leader. Um, and these are things that um, I feel everybody needs in their communication tool belt to make sure that they can go into a meeting and be super successful. So um, I certainly encourage everyone to learn different questions that are going to open up the conversation versus shut it down. Um, and that's really important when you're learning to get along with everybody and play nicely in the sandbox. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was our last question today. Um, thank you to our presenters, our panel, and thank you very much to all of our attendees. Um, it was a great panel and we hope to see you soon. Uh, Women in Processing will be coming back soon. So stay tuned and thank you again very much.